This module provides an overview of principles related to vehicle speed management at roundabouts and performing fastest pass speed checks. Refer also to part two of this module for a hands-on demonstration. When designing a roundabout, one of the fundamental principles is achieving speed control. Getting slow and consistent speeds is really a critical element to getting the operational and safe performance that we expect from roundabouts. And vehicle speeds impact a whole host of items, including crash frequency and severity, pedestrian and bicycle accessibility and comfort, vehicle yield rates at entries, uh, capacity of a roundabout and the size of gaps that are needed for vehicles to enter a roundabout, uh, the size of sight distance triangles, driver comprehension and visibility of signing and markings, as well as geometric elements like merge and taper lengths if you have a lane drop on an exit from a roundabout. The curved geometry of roundabouts is set up to physically limit vehicle speeds. We perform fastest pass speed checks to evaluate the speed control provided by the design as the vehicles travel along the various curved paths through the roundabout. The procedure approximates the centerline path of a passenger vehicle to identify theoretical attainable speeds for design purposes. An example of the fastest path is illustrated on this figure, where the red line represents the vehicle centerline as it hugs the various curb lines. The geometry should achieve entry speeds at or below 25 miles per hour for a single lane roundabout. Maximum speeds for two lane roundabouts vary by design case, as will be discussed further in subsequent slides. Designs with raised dividers between lanes would also be set up for a maximum entry speed of 25 miles per hour. However, two lane entries with only striped lane lines are expected to limit speeds that are below 30 miles an hour, assuming vehicles are ignoring all lane lines as shown in the figure. Under higher volume conditions, we'd expect that vehicles would generally stay in their own lane, which would result in a smaller radius and slower speed through the entry. However, under low volume conditions, the vehicle is able to travel across the full width of the roadway, across lane lines, which results in a larger radius, a flatter path, and a higher speed. Under these low volume conditions, we want to make sure the geometry is still physically slowing vehicle speeds below 30 miles an hour to make sure the driver is able to navigate the subsequent curves as they come into the roundabout without losing control, as well as be able to perceive and react to pedestrians and cyclists. When performing fastest pass speed checks, we're trying to set up the path through the intersection that would reflect the kind of smoothest, flattest path that a passenger car might reasonably be expected to take in the absence of other traffic. It's going to be dictated by the physical geometry, including curb faces or edges of pavement, and it'll ignore lane lines and lane markings like I previously discussed. For each approach, we're going to look at three paths and five key radii. So we've got a blue path here that is the through path where we have a initial radius at the entry that will dictate the entry speed. We've got a radius around the central island that will dictate our circulating speed with the R2. And then we have an R3, which is an exit speed, an exit radius. We also have a left turn path going around the central island. The tightest portion along that path is our R4 left turn radius and corresponding left turn speed. And then we'll have a R5 right turn where the R5 is the smallest radius along that path that's dictating our right turn speed. We'll perform these checks for each of the individual approaches to come up with a overlay of the fastest paths for the overall intersection. This slide presents GDOT's fastest path speed criteria, the maximum speed and radii that are desired for the different path components. As previously mentioned, for the entering portion of the path, R1, we typically want to see speeds below 25 miles per hour for any single lane roundabouts and some multi-lane cases, and we'll discuss those more in a couple of slides. For most multi-lane cases, case one designs, you would have up to a 30 mile per hour speed allowed, but typically trying to keep it lower than that if possible. Circulatory path radii R2 typically operate in the range of 15 to 25 miles per hour. And then at the exits where pedestrians are present, keeping slower speeds through the exit also becomes more important 
with the desired maximum speed of 25 miles per hour at the exits. Where no pedestrians are present, GDOT allows a slightly higher speed up in the range of 30 to 35 miles per hour. But again, keeping speed slow is desirable where possible. Where speeds exceed 25 miles per hour and pedestrians are expected to be present, refer back to the GDOT roundabout guide for additional discussion related to supplemental treatments at the pedestrian crossings or stopping site distance um, considerations related to vehicles being able to yield to pedestrians at those uh, exits based upon the predicted speeds. For the left turn path radius R4, vehicles need to operate within a range of 10 to 20 miles per hour. And from a speed consistency standpoint, we look at the difference between the entering R1 speed and the left turn speed, which is our slowest circulating speed. And we want those relative speeds to be within a range of 10 to 15 miles an hour. So if we have a 30 mile per hour entering speed on a multi-lane entry, and we've got a 15 mile an hour circulating speed, that would give us a 15 mile an hour speed differential. And that's the maximum that we would like to see um, between the entering and circulating traffic. For the right turn path radius, we want to keep the speed similar to what we'd use for our typical R1 and have them operating below 25 miles per hour. The typical is a 15 to 25 mile per hour range. For some types of roundabouts, there may be additional considerations related to the movements that will be present at an intersection. And here's one example where you have a three-legged intersection, and this is in a Y configuration where you have roughly even angles between legs. You'll end up with a through path with an R1, R2, R3, and you'll end up with a right turn path, but there'll be no separate left turn path. So in this particular case, you would only have four radii that are being measured instead of five. So just something to watch out for. When constructing fastest paths, we assume that a vehicle will stay five feet from any curb face. This assumes that a vehicle is about six feet wide, plus or minus, so from the center of the vehicle to the edge, we have about three feet in width. And then from the edge of the vehicle to the curb face, we have another two feet. So this is approximately the closest that we're expecting a vehicle to get as it's traversing through the intersection, taking the fastest path. We assume the same offset distance from a roadway center line where we have two-way traffic and a double yellow. Where we have other painted edge lines, we would expect a vehicle to get a little bit closer, essentially put its wheels right along the edge line and only use a three foot offset from the edge line to the center of the vehicle. In these figures, those offset distances are identified with the dotted line. We use those in the next step to construct a B-spline curve through the roundabout that reflects that center line of the vehicle. That is the fastest path shown in red. We'll draw the initial path all the way through the intersection, and then we'll adjust the path using these little handles to make sure that at any point along the path, we're meeting our minimum distance from all of our curb faces. Step four is to go through and then measure the path at the key points of interest. So we have the path is reflecting a spiral curve. So we're actually gonna measure arcs over the path at the entry, circulatory roadway, along the exit, and at the left and right turn points, and come up with what the radii are that reflect those curves at those areas of interest. We can then use those radii and convert them to expected speeds that a vehicle can travel through those portions of the path. For two lane roundabouts, there's three different cases, and the cases actually apply to truck accommodations, but some of the geometric elements and geometric differences between them are going to dictate slightly different approaches to laying out fastest path speeds. For case one designs, we have a simple two-lane roundabout where we have painted lane lines and two-lane entering, two-lane entries, two-lane circulatory roadway, and some cases two-lane exits here. For this case, we're assuming that vehicles use the full lane width and cross any painted lines so that the fastest path is gonna end up 
crossing a lane line on the entry. It'll cross back across lane lines as it goes to the circulatory roadway. The left turns are expected to maintain this same fastest path and then will traverse around the central island. The right turns would also follow generally a similar path to start and then we'll make their right turn and utilize both lanes on the exit. For case two and case three designs, GDOT is utilizing some additional curbing to help channelize vehicles and support slower speeds. For a case two design, you have, for both case two and three designs, you have a channel, a raised curb channelization along the lane line through the entry and through the exit. So you can see here, both designs have raised curbing through the entry and exit. And that's going to physically channelize the vehicle and prevent them from being able to just cut across lanes like you would see in a case one design. The primary difference between these two is that a case two design does not have raised channelization through the circulatory roadway. This is just painted markings and rumble strips. With the case three design, however, there is another raised curb within the roundabout. So for these designs, because there's this, these additional raised curbing elements, GDOT has prescribed some illustrations to help provide guidance on how the paths should be drawn to reflect the fastest paths through these types of designs. For these entries, vehicles would need to stay in their own lane through the entry because the curb line will physically prevent them from cutting across lanes. If you were in the inside lane, that's going to end up being a smaller radius and a tighter path. So the fastest path is assumed to start and stay in the outside lane through the entry. And for this, we would end up with a 25 mile or max entry speed because we're staying in one lane. We're not crossing two lanes like we are in a case one design. But then because we just have striping within the roundabout, the path is assumed to cross lane lines and hug the central island. And then GDOT is assuming that the vehicle will stay in the outside lane and traverse through a flat path through the exit. For a case three design, similarly assume that a vehicle starts in the outside lane, but because we have this raised channelization within the circular roadway, that vehicle has to stay in the outside lane all the way through its path. So we're going to assume essentially this is operating as a single lane and we're gonna end up using a 25 mile an hour max speed through this as well. And it's effectively a fastest path through a single lane through the roundabout. The left turn would be assumed to use the inside lane and traverse around the central island as usual. The right turn would be assumed to stay in the outside lane. The measured radii along the fastest path are converted to speeds using the equations contained in NCHRP Report 672. Two equations, 61 and 62, are provided to account for the positive and negative cross slopes that a vehicle encounters along the fastest path. Equation 64 is used to calculate speeds of vehicles through the exit, typically near the crosswalk, based on vehicle acceleration as it leaves the roundabout. These equations are also provided in Appendix D of the GDOT Roundabout Design Guide, along with additional information. The speed radius relationship is also illustrated here in the figure using the red and blue lines for equation 6-1 and 6-2. Equation 6-1 with a positive cross slope is reflected with the red line and generally results in higher speeds. For a typical roundabout that has cross slopes draining towards the outside curb line, it's common that the R1 would have a positive cross slope through the entry, as well as a positive cross slope through the exit R3 and the right turn R5. Around the circular roadway, the R2 would typically have a negative cross slope, as well as the left turn R4 with a negative cross slope. However, early in the design phase, it's typically not known what the vertical design of the roundabout is going to be. And so the GDOT Roundabout Design Guide Appendix D recommends the use of a positive cross slope for all calculations in order to achieve a conservative estimate early in the design phase.